Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, how are you? I'm Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's weekly ADHD Experts broadcast. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Stephen Hinshaw about the special issues of girls and women with attention deficit disorder. You know, not so long ago, ADHD was pretty widely considered a condition for boys and then boys who it was thought outgrew the condition in adulthood. We really now know that girls and boys are at equal risk for developing attention deficit disorder and that it is often a lifetime condition for either gender. What's more, the stigma surrounding ADHD is pretty often stronger for women, which can delay diagnosis, can delay treatment, and especially when the inattentive type symptoms are mistaken for something else, depression, anxiety, whatever it may be. So we're so fortunate to welcome Dr. Hinshaw here today. He's a professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, where he served as department chair from 2004 through 2011 to talk about ADHD in women and girls, how it presents, what effective treatments may be, and why the stigma of ADHD can even be growing. Dr. Henshaw has widely published research, over 300 published articles, focusing on developmental psychopathology in a number of areas of mental health. He has written extensively on the stigmas of mental health specifically and is the author of 12 books, including The ADHD Explosion, Myths, Medication, Money, and Today's Push for Performance. For more information, um, you can find his website, www.stephenhinshawauthor.com. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Hinshaw. We're so grateful for your time on this important topic. All right. Thanks so much. And let's dive in. Susan just mentioned, and in fact, I learned this in grad school some decades ago, hyperactivity, as it was called then, or ADD, or today ADHD, was really a male thing and a childhood thing, a boy thing, not not a girl thing. We know that just about all neurodevelopmental disorders, ADHD, autism, Tourette's, Uh, severe aggressive conduct problems are, in fact, in childhood more prevalent in boys than girls. For ADHD, this is about 2.5 to 1. Uh, For autism, it's closer to 4 or 5 to 1. Tourette's, 5 or 6 to 1. And we could go into all the biological and sexual socialization reasons for this. But it's not 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 the way we thought it was for, for many decades. It's also true that if you're a woman and you go to an ADHD clinic and it turns out you have ADHD, you're in good company because with development and with time, that is by adulthood, the sex ratio drops, still maybe slightly uh, more predominant for men, but maybe 1.5 to 1. One reason may be that girls, when they're young, tend to have more than boys, the purely inattentive version of ADHD. And that actually tends to persist longer because fidgeting and gross motor impulsivity do tend to go away with time, but the underlying inattention and deficits and self-regulation tend to persist. It also may be, frankly, that women are more revealing and disclosing than men in adulthood of problems with self-regulation uh, attention, focus, etc. There's also been way beyond today to be the subject of a full seminar, some recent evidence around the world that it may be the case that particularly in women, ADHD might not, as we always thought was the case, start in childhood and progress, but there may be something called adult onset ADHD. This is highly scrutinized Uh, highly contested these days. My own belief is that it's very rare to wake up one day when you're 30 and suddenly have ADHD. There have been precursors. Uh, Maybe now there's no attentional demands. Uh, Maybe the earlier ADHD was masked by other conditions, etc. Nonetheless, for these three reasons on the slide here in the middle, by adulthood, women with ADHD are more salient even than in childhood. 25 years ago, I was a doubter. I was a doubter of the belief that ADHD was only a male thing. 
And so my team and I wrote a big grant to the National Institute of Mental Health. We revised it once, and then it got a superb score. And our goal was to find a large sample of girls with ADHD, uh, have them go through our summer camp programs, where we could learn a lot about their neuropsychology and their peer relationships and their academics and their daily behavior. And as we told the parents back then in the, in the late 90s, we would like to follow your daughters for the rest of their lives. Well, that was a bold promise because you can only get funding five years at a time, and we would have had to show the National Institute of Mental Health that we were a productive research group and learning important things. And so for several cycles, we went back, uh, and the Berkeley Girls with ADHD Longitudinal Study, affectionately known as the BGAL study, um, how's that for a clever acronym, uh, began. So our goal was to get in the San Francisco Bay Area a diverse representative sample of girls with carefully diagnosed ADHD. Our summer research programs were really a laboratory for studying all kinds of one-on-one, but even more important, classroom and small group behaviors. It turns out that when we published our first paper on the early years, the elementary school years of the BGALS sample, we on that date in July of 2002, essentially doubled the world's literature on girls with ADHD, which isn't so much bragging as decrying the sorry state of affairs regarding how little research on girls with ADHD had been done before that time. We found on the basis of 10-hour assessments to confirm the diagnosis and our extensive summer camp measures that in just about every domain we looked, attention in the classroom, impulse control problems, aggressive behavior, internalizing, shy, shy and sad and depressed behavior, anxious behavior, neuropsychological measures of executive functioning, et cetera, et cetera. Our group with ADHD was far more impaired than our normative comparison group, same neighborhood, same age, same ethnicity uh, of girls without ADHD. So this in many ways confirmed what we'd known for boys with ADHD for decades. ADHD is a a serious thing. Uh, The impairments are real. And we had the luxury with our summer programs of not just relying on parent reports or teacher reports, but having direct observation of friendships, of social behavior, of neuropsychological functioning live in our summer camps. So this next slide essentially uh, goes over what I just mentioned uh, quickly. Girls with ADHD truly have impairment. Intriguingly, about two-thirds of the girls in our program with ADHD were diagnosed with the combined form, today called presentation. It used to be called subtype. The combined form of ADHD, meaning that they had not only high levels of inattention and disorganization, but high levels of impulsivity, and hyperactivity. About a third of our girls with ADHD had the purely inattentive variant. On just about every measure we could uh, think of to administer, those groups were not terribly distinct. Both types had significant academic impairments. Both types had trouble making and keeping friends. Both had significant neuropsychological deficits. The girls with the combined presentation exhibited more aggressive behavior than the purely inattentive group. They were also more likely than the purely inattentive group to be overtly rejected by their peers. I really don't want to play with this girl. The inattentive uh, group of girls were more, well, I don't really know her that well. She seems kind of shy and not as socially adept more ignored socially than outright rejected. But on just about every other measure, these, now they're called presentations of ADHD, were less uh, distinct than one might have thought. Interestingly, we used the same staff ratings and behavior observation codes that we used in many years of running programs for boys with ADHD. So the measures stayed the same. And objectively speaking, the girls with ADHD were not as noncompliant and aggressive as our boys had been. In fact, they were far less so. Uh, 
they had other ways of uh, getting in trouble and um, having problems, but they weren't as overtly aggressive. On the other hand, during the diagnostic phase, especially relying on parent information, the parents of these girls reported just as high rates as had the parents of the boys of oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, etc., meaning that there are still at home lots of stresses of raising a girl with ADHD. And some of the maybe subtler to an objective observer, but not so subtle to a family, signs of noncompliance, irritability, were quite salient for families of these girls. So we're going to go through now the progression of the BGAL study. We ran the summer camp programs when the girls were in grade school, average age of about nine. We got 92% of them back with their families around five years later for an early to mid-adolescent assessment. We didn't run the, program, the summer programs again, but we did uh, a long two-day uh, assessment battery. By the earliest years of adulthood, average age of about 20, we got 95% of the whole sample back. And in our most recent follow-up, in the, at the end of emerging adulthood, around 26 years of age on average, we again got well over 90% of the entire sample back. Some people, when we submit our scientific papers, say, well, that's impossible. You can't, in a longitudinal study, especially in California, where lots of people move, get that many participants back. Well, in fact, we do, <laughs> and we continue to do so. The families and girls were a priority during their programs. At each follow-up assessment, our staff are trained to, um, <laughs> the customer's always right, the participants are always right. We accommodated. We would fly to families if they couldn't make it to California, uh, provided compensation for travel for the families and their daughters to come back in for assessments. We were also able, over time, to use social media, for example, private um, friending on Facebook to keep track of some of the participants that we might have lost to contact otherwise. If you do a longitudinal study, those kinds of studies are really only as good as how many, what percentage of your participants you retain, because otherwise you can probably uh, guess that those whom you don't follow up probably differ in a lot of ways from those whom you do. So getting 93, 95% back uh, has been a real tribute to our staff and to the dedication of the families and the now young women that we've been studying. What have we found overall? Girls with ADHD, as they become adolescents and young adults, do show an improvement. Many of their ADHD symptoms get less significantly impairing over time. On the other hand, they're still way more impaired on average than our comparison group of non-ADHD girls, whom we've also followed up just as diligently. In fact, our girls with ADHD, now women with ADHD, maintain pretty strong academic deficits, especially in math. The math performance of our girls with ADHD as they get into their 20s uh, isn't just worse than that of the comparison group, but uh, is, is actually tailing off. Math, of course, is the stereotype field uh, where girls aren't supposed to do well. It also requires a lot of executive function. Uh, if you're not doing well in math classes, you're obviously not going to have objective good math scores later on. Executive functions improved in our girls with ADHD, but remained, even at the age of 26 or so, significantly behind those of our comparison group. Planning response inhibition, working memory, correcting errors. These objectively measured neuropsychological executive skills remain problematic for women with ADHD beyond girlhood. Peer relationships. Of course, we had our sociometric assessments during the summer camps where we could directly ask girls about their classmates. This becomes harder to do as a participant gets older, but relationship quality significantly lower on average in the young women with ADHD than in the comparison group. So these are the measures that we've repeated at each wave of the BGALS follow-up. 
you need to do that in a longitudinal study or otherwise you're comparing apples to oranges. You need to keep as many measures as possible the same. But it's also important, of course, to change some measures according to development. We didn't measure during the summer programs the domain of, and let's go to the next slide, self-harm, self-injury. By adolescence and adulthood, we brought that into our battery. So let's do a quick categorization here. Self-harming behavior is the blanket term. It could include actual suicidal behavior, strong urges to end one's life, actual attempts on one's life, or non-suicidal self-injury, NSSI is the acronym that's often used. Here the goal is not to end one's life, but to express or in some ways mask or deflect deep psychological pain by cutting, burning, other forms of self-mutilation. This can range NSSI from mild cuticle pulling all the way to very severe self-injury. And again, the distinction is NSSI, there's not the intent to die in suicidal behavior there is. I should point out, and this is the last point on this slide, that despite that clinical and theoretical distinction, a pretty potent predictor of later suicide attempt is a history earlier of increasingly severe non-suicidal self-injury. You may over time become inured to pain, uh, try uh, ever more uh, stringent means, if you will, to, to harm yourself, uh, and suicidal intentions can grow from a history of such. We found at our Wave 3 assessment something actually fairly shocking. And when we first published these results in 2012, again, the average age of the participants was around 20 at this point, ranging from about 18 to about 23 or 4, that follow the red bars on the bar graph here. If you were a girl back during our summer programs with the combined form of ADHD, in other words, lots of impulsivity as well as inattention, 23% had made a serious suicide attempt by the age of 20, compared to 8% of the purely inattentive group and 6% of our comparison group. Well, I mean, you might want to stop me right there and say 6% of a non-ADHD group has made a serious suicide attempt by the age of 20. This is exactly the national average. As we know, suicide rates uh, are going up in all age groups. So this isn't some skewed Bay Area sample, fairly representative of the United States, but you see a three or four times greater risk of later suicide attempt in the girls who had that early impulsivity as well as inattention. Now go over to the next set of uh, bars on the bar graph. What about moderate to severe non-suicidal self-injury, NSSI? 51% of the girls originally diagnosed with the combined form of ADHD were engaging, again, this is not the mild end of the spectrum, this is moderate to severe self-injury, uh, a little bit over a quarter of the inattentive group and 19% of our matched comparison girls. 19%, again, you may be asking, of girls by their early 20s, young women by their early 20s engaging in moderate to severe self-injury, this is exactly the national average. If you have uh, not been following psychological and psychiatric um, reports in the media of late, you'll have missed that non-suicidal self-injury, especially among teenage girls. Also, boys, too, is reaching epidemic proportions. But again, two-and-a-half-fold greater risk if you have the early impulsivity related to the combined form of ADHD. So what do developmental researchers want to know. They want to understand such devastating findings. So here we have a mediator pathway. Let's uh, be less statistical. Over on the left was the summer camps when the girls were girls and some girls had ADHD and, and some did not in their programs. Over on the right is first the severity of the non-suicidal self-injury in which you're engaging. In the middle and above 
is what we measured at wave two during early to mid-adolescence. And it turns out that the biggest explainers or mediators of the ADHD to NSSI link were during adolescence, number one, to cancel underlying test, which is a neuropsychological measure of how well you can inhibit responding. It's a measure of impulsivity. And number two, parent and teacher reports of externalizing symptoms. These are the girls who are acting out in school and at home. So the pathway from early ADHD to later NSSI is carried through poor response inhibition and aggressive symptoms. Next slide, same model, but the different outcome on the right here is actual suicide attempt rather than NSSI and the adolescent explanatory variable or mediator here is the girls and parents and teachers reports of her internalizing anxious, depressed, and withdrawn symptoms. So I'm just going to flip back to predict NSSI externalizing and response inhibition, moving to where we were a second ago, to predict actual suicide attempt, internalizing symptoms in adolescence. So as you can see, we're finding different pathways here. This is Erica Swanson's um, dissertation now published in 2014 in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Jocelyn Mesa in our lab, let's move to the next slide, published a paper a couple of years later. Same model, her hypothesis was during adolescence, how you get along with your peers, or perhaps how you don't get along so well with your peers, may be important explanatory factors. And indeed, with over on the left, ADHD symptoms, these are a neuropsychological measure of impulsivity early on, predicting to the severity of your NSSI. What carried the day in adolescence here to explain was the girl's report of whether she was victimized frequently, either physically or relationally, by her peers. What about the same model but predicting suicide attempts? Here, the peer variable that's explaining is the middle school teacher's report of the percentage of classmates who really don't want to be around that girl. So social preference or actually social rejection. So let's go back as we did before. Peer victimization in adolescence is helping to explain the distressing severity of non-suicidal self-injury. But the girls who were rejected by their peer group are the most likely to ultimately attempt their lives uh, by their early 20s. We also measured, and this is my Gundelman study, also published in 2016 from our lab, independent coders spent about a year going through each girl's chart, not aware of who had ADHD and who didn't, and found evidence or not for physical abuse, sexual abuse, or child neglect. Summing those three together, the girls with ADHD were somewhat more likely than the comparison group to have received such maltreatment. That's not terribly surprising. Uh, we could talk about that a lot more if we had time. But most importantly, within the group with ADHD, those who had also experienced this form of early maltreatment, that experience raised the bar, raised the risk, rather, so that about 35% of the girls with ADHD, the combined form, those who'd been impulsive as girls, who'd also been maltreated as girls, had made a serious suicide attempt. Just as with bipolar disorder, bipolar disorder is a highly heritable condition. Genes are responsible for most of the risk. The same is true for ADHD, despite the stereotypes. Genes convey much of the risk for ADHD, but for both bipolar disorder and ADHD, added to the genetic vulnerability, if you put in the equation maltreatment, now the risk for serious long-term outcomes like suicide, it's parallel in both conditions. It's not genes or environment. It's not biology or context. It's genes and biology and context and environment. The most difficult outcomes 
pertain to people with a genetic risk compounded by uh, early adversity. On the positive side of the spectrum, our girls with ADHD over time did not exemplify terribly high rates of substance abuse. They did have more problems with nicotine than the comparison group, which is true for boys. But unlike many boys' uh, follow-up samples, we did not see greatly inflated rates of uh, alcohol abuse or illicit substance use. We also did not find, partly because our normative comparison group had relatively high rates, too much in the way of eating pathology, binge eating, bulimia symptoms, etc. On the other hand, self-harm as an outcome, we now know from national studies in Sweden and Denmark, where millions are studied, ADHD in both boys and girls, men and women, is a risk factor for uh, the desire to end your own life. And that propensity, as our study has shown, is particularly pronounced for girls with ADHD who've been impulsive early on. A brief tidbit of findings. We published these uh, last year and more papers to come. What did we find by our wave four follow-up? The young women are now somewhere between 23 and 29. They're uh, past the earliest years of adulthood uh, into, into the end of what's called emerging adulthood. A fairly shocking statistic is that just about exactly 10% of our comparison group had had an unplanned pregnancy uh, between uh, girlhood and uh, this wave for follow-up. 45% of the ADHD group had. This is predicted both by inattention, maybe not um, paying enough attentive uh, detail to contraception, et cetera, and by impulsivity. Uh, if it feels good, do it. Uh, I've got to please the guy right now, not using uh, protection. Unplanned pregnancy is a health risk for women, teenage girls and women. It's certainly a risk for uh, if the child is born, uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. So this is one of those incredible examples of you don't really need a statistical test to figure out 45% versus 10% hugely inflated risk in the girls with ADHD as they grow older. We've also found, and again, these are just tidbit findings, by high school, just about as many girls with ADHD graduated as did our comparison group. And the families will tell you, they often had to carry those daughters on their backs to get them through high school. Once beyond high school, multiple community colleges, failing grades, far better college success in the comparison group than the ADHD group. Also, many of the young women are now employed, but there's employment problems, absenteeism, uh, lower rated work performance in the group with ADHD than in the comparison group. And we all know that for the millennials and post-millennials of this era, harder and harder to make it on your own. Three-fourths of college grads are going back to live at home for a time period. But if you've got ADHD and are a young woman added to the mix, establishing independence, getting your post-secondary education, having job and relationship skills um, is adding to the burden. And so we're finding far lower rates of independence in our BGALs, uh, ADHD participants, than in the control group. Let's shift gears and for a few minutes talk about stigma and then we'll end up very briefly with treatment. What does stigma literally mean? It's a Greek term, origins in ancient Greece. Those in Athens who'd actually fought for Sparta or former slaves were branded so that everyone would know who was a member of the social outcast group. Stigma today is more psychological than a physical brand Hitler did brand people in concentration camps with numbers on their wrists. Some nations literally branded HIV-positive individuals at the start of the epidemic. But most stigma today, we know you're in that group. We don't have to brand you. And as you can see in the middle of the slide, racial prejudice, sexual minority status, women, you don't have to be a minority, 51% of the world's women still stigmatized in, in, in many cultures. Etc. Etc. have all received stigma. 
Left-handedness, if you're left-handed today, probably means you have good spatial abilities and may get into MIT, but not that many decades ago, being left-handed was considered quite deviant, and kids who thought that were thought to be left-handed were tried to be converted into right-handedness. The moral of the story here is as social mores and norms change, attributes that were formerly stigmatized may become much less so. But the enduring racial prejudice we see, changing but still prevalent uh, stigma and prejudice against sexual minorities, he is matched and overmatched today by the bottom three. Who are the most stigmatized people in modern society? People with mental illness or neurodevelopmental disorders, people who are homeless, and people who abuse substances. We still think in 2018 that such people have brought these conditions on. They don't try hard enough. Their families caused it. All sorts of these. We, we may, may not believe in animal or evil spirits the way we did in earlier points in history, but there's still an attribution to personal weakness or family weakness as having caused these conditions. I wrote a book on this topic just over 10 years ago now called The Mark of Shame, kind of a history and current status report on the stigmatization of mental illness and neurodevelopmental disorders. My most recent book published last year is Another Kind of Madness, A Journey Through the Stigma and Hope of Mental Illness. That's my dad on the left and me as an 18-year-old on the cover that had very severe bipolar disorder, misdiagnosed his whole life, spent way too much time in snake pit institutions. When he would vanish, though, when my sister and I were young, both he, when he returned, and my mother were forbidden by the medical profession from ever mentioning where he'd been because it was too shameful. It was too stigmatized. And so I grew up in the Midwest kind of a great upbringing in many ways, but always wondering what I'd done wrong to send dad away for three months, six months, or in one case, 12 months at a time, and so he had vanished into thin air. So I know from personal experience what family stigma is all about. There's a lot of scientific evidence that bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, the most severe and psychotic conditions tend to receive more stigma than, say, depression. Depression can be quite severe, it's not quite as threatening. On the other hand, ADHD receives a lot of stigma. How could that possibly be? It's not as overtly severe, again, as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. But what's the issue here? People with ADHD, almost by definition, are consistently inconsistent, doing well part of the day, doing well in math class if they're good at it, not so well in English. Uh, whether you're in treatment or not, if you're in treatment, do the medications wear off? Uh, are you in a particularly challenging task or situation versus one that you're pretty good at? The inconsistency is a stigma producer. Well, I saw you behave really well uh, last week uh, in practice. Why did you mess up this week? I know you can do it in class or on the job, but you're so inconsistent. It must be that you're not trying hard enough. So paradoxically, or maybe not so paradoxically if you think about it, conditions marked by inconsistency and often really good performance as well as not so good performance may receive high stigma because the perceiver wonders, what the heck aren't you doing uh, well enough? Why aren't you trying hard enough? I know you can do it. We know, for example, that in some parent surveys, Parents of who used to be called kids with Asperger's, high-functioning autism now, received more stigma than kids with much more serious autism spectrum disorders, even kids who hardly have language uh, and have intellectual disabilities. There's a feeling of rising with the tide and helping kids with more severe ASDs, but for the high-functioning group or the so-called Asperger's group, people think, well, that kid's just weird. Um, often boys again in that group, uh, why doesn't he just pull his act together? So stigma pertains not only to the most severe psychotic forms of mental disorder, uh, but also to some of the consistently inconsistent forms like ADHD. If a group receives stigma, it's not inevitable, but it's likely the members of that group will start to believe in the stereotypes of society and believe that they're not worthy of or amenable to treatment. 
So self-stigma, sometimes called internalized stigma, can be a big barrier for treatment. I think this is a big issue for many women with ADHD. Courtesy stigma, Goffman, who wrote the, the book on stigma in 1963, said, somewhat sarcastically, if society bothers to stigmatize a group, of course it's only courtesy to stigmatize anybody close to that group, friends, loved ones, families, and of course families <clears throat> were explicitly blamed for having caused autism, schizophrenia, and ADHD for most of the 20th century. And even professionals, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers, psychiatrists, we, to be stigmatizing for a minute, we're the kind of professionals who work with uh, crazy people. We don't do basic science, pure science. So even professionals were searching or giving service to people with neurodevelopmental or mental disorders can be under the shadow of stigma too. It's quite pervasive. What is the link between stigma and intervention? We know that girls, as compared to boys, women as compared to men, are pretty much equal. There's individual differences, of course, but as groups, responders to medications, if they get medications and if they get for ADHD, evidence-based care to find the right agent and the right dosage and if treatment's monitored. We know in addition that girls as well as boys respond to behavioral therapy, family and home management, school management, and in adulthood to CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, time management, organizational skills. But it may be that women have internalized more than a lot of guys and men something wrong with them. ADHD may emerge a bit later in life, not until middle school, high school, when the demands get harder. And again, the inattentive form of ADHD is less visible and noticeable, uh, so that pertains more to girls and women than to the more florid forms in boys. Many women with ADHD wonder why they just can't pull it together and do it, become perfectionistic, wondering if they only tried harder, couldn't they adapt those study skills and iron out those relationship troubles. Intervention, especially with a group focus, may be quite important for girls and women because girls and women, let's face it, are in many ways more social than boys and men and group intervention to not uh, absolve professionals from responsibility, but to model peer support and to model ways of coping would be quite important for girls and women. Again, treatment is a huge antidote to internalization, self-stigma, the belief there's something wrong with you or your family, but we've got to get people access to treatment. This is a health insurance issue. Uh, this is a psychological access issue, believing that you deserve treatment, and we need to do a far better job of evidence-based assessments to really know, even though it's on a continuum, who's got the symptoms of ADHD uh, that merit accommodations and treatment. No one is going to get treatment if they feel ashamed or non-deserving. The ultimate paradox here is that for ADHD, along with most other forms of mental disorder, we don't have cures, but treatments can facilitate recovery. They can promote symptom relief, take away many of the impairments. But if you don't get treatment, the symptoms and impairments persist, stigma builds, and we're in a vicious cycle. We need to do a better job of developing virtuous cycles rather than vicious cycles. So we've gone about 35 minutes by my count, and uh, I'm glad to uh, listen to comments and questions uh, for the rest of our hour. Okay, Dr. Henshaw, you've left everyone quite depressed. <laughs> um, there, um, there are a number of questions to, that ask um, were the girls and women in your study treated? Um, were they were they treated for their ADHD? Um, was there any reason, to your knowledge, why these um, pretty dire uh, results might have changed? Had right. there been different or better treatment? Um, so, very good question, and I didn't have much time to go through all the details. So these were enrichment summer camps, they provided free of charge 
research funded. We wanted to learn about the girls. And we designed them. We had the point system and designed them to be therapeutic. But it wasn't a clinical trial. We didn't randomly assign Mm -hmm. some of the girls to medication, some not, some to parent management training, some not. It turns out that even 20 years ago, when these camps uh, were running full steam, about 40% of the girls got medication during some point of their childhood. Others got school services, uh, family therapy, uh, parent management training, which has grown in the barrier since that time. So this was not an untreated sample. But back in the 90s when we ran the camps, we don't have systematic data. We didn't uh, invade the doctor's offices or family therapists of, of every participant. Many of the treatments that you get for ADHD are not evidence-based. If a practitioner doesn't really know what ADHD is and the risks it entails, I'm sure many of these treatments were short-lived. We know that by adolescence, kids who are medicated for ADHD, 90 to 95% of them stop the medication. They don't like the feeling. Uh, doctors don't know how to really work with families to motivate uh, adherence to medication through adolescence, et cetera, et cetera. So we do have some evidence. Again, we didn't randomly assign, so we can't be sure about this, that those girls who got SSRI treatment for anxiety and depression were somewhat less likely than the graphs I showed to develop self-injury than those girls who did not get such treatments. So that's encouraging. We need to do a better job of identifying and accurately assessing ADHD. We need to recognize that early impulsivity paired with response disinhibition, paired with maltreatment and peer rejection can lead to, again, these are not easy slides to witness or to present. Mm -hmm. We've been devastated by some of these negative long-term outcomes. On the other hand, had there been more time, we'd have presented more stories of resilience. Many of the girls self-injuring during their adolescent years have stopped by their 20s, have found better pathways, career opportunities, relationships, and don't need to kind of either dull or accentuate that emotional pain into physical pain over time. Nonetheless, the findings are the findings, and I think the BGAL sample has emphasized to the field that without systematic treatment, ADHD in girls is uh, no laughing matter at all. Right. Um, uh, I guess the question that that is being raised by our listeners is, what are did, did you get any sense of for those girls who 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 did better? What were the positive impl- um, what what helped their lives go better than the, the the group that went toward you know self harming behavior and suicide and so forth? Um, were there any factors well, that I'll, you I'll identified that helped with resilience? So we'll be back maybe in a year or two because we're we're analyzing the data along these lines right now, and we've in some ways waited until the mid-20s to really have a, a, a more stringent longitudinal picture. Right now, it looks as though for one girl, it's having somebody believe in her. Mm-hmm. For another, it's finding that one subject she's good at and getting reinforcement for that. For someone else, it's someone outside the family who encouraged. For someone else, it's getting back into treatment. We don't have evidence so far, but that's why we've got to do a bigger and better look now, uh, given the age of the sample, that this is the formula for everyone to promote resilience. We think, based on our data from the BGAL sample, that resilience is kind of person-specific. Now, that's great. It's also a little bit depressing. How do you know what that is for that particular individual? It's like individualized treatments in cancer, individualized treatments in depression. Having a clinician work with the family actively to identify strengths, find those relationship supports to motivate the girl out of ADHD symptoms and into an area of confidence is probably the best advice I can give. But the short answer is we don't have a formula yet that says these are the protective factors that work uh, en masse for all girls with ADHD. Okay. Um, you know, we do have a number of people who, who are posting that their, you know, teen with ADHD is doing well, you know, is doing well socially, yeah. is doing well at school. And so, you know, these results are not their experience. And so they're wondering if there's anything um, 
anything to be said about that. Has, has there been any formal study on, on the positive traits? This is a question from Christina on the positive traits of ADHD. So let, let me just speak to that. Number one, our sample was probably skewed. I mean, we talk to pediatricians and they talk to school districts and we put ads in the paper and we put people through a very extensive battery. We had a pretty severe sample of, of girls with ADHD back 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Many girls probably didn't have, with ADHD currently, didn't have all of those risk factors. And in fact, there is better awareness of ADHD in girls these days. Schools on average are responding better. Families are getting treatment earlier. That may be the biggest protective factor in and of itself. Right. It's not doom and gloom for every young woman, you know, girl or young woman with ADHD. But again, as risk factors accumulate, early impulsivity, response disinhibition, aggressive and depressed behavior and maltreatment, you put those four or five things together, and those are the ones with the worst outcomes by far. Okay, right. It's also the case, I will say, that as development happens, new barriers come into place and new opportunities come into place. Many girls with ADHD didn't know they had it, never got it diagnosed until not just high school, college. Now the workload is really hard. Or that first job that really required sustained effort over time, that's when those early symptoms that were barely noticeable before come to the fore. So maybe some of the girls represented uh, out in the audience today are going to have six significant challenges as they move forward. On the other hand, our sample is not it's only 228 girls. It's not nationally representative. We don't want to overplay some of the problems we found, but nor would it be ethical for us to underplay how severe ADHD can be in its worst instances. Right. Right. No, I mean, I think this is a wake-up call. Take this seriously. Um, yeah. pro- provide supports. Because we certainly know many, many people who with ADHD, women with ADHD, who do well. So um, the supports right. are there. And you mentioned a minute ago, positive traits. Are there, I mean, some would contend ADHD is really a hidden gift. If society just got its act together, people with ADHD, everyone could thrive. I think that's partly true, but I think at its extreme, uh, it's probably misguided. Mm -hmm. In any society or in any species, having a diversity of traits is good. If the environment changes, you want to have people who can survive. Being impulsive and exploratory, being inattentive in a factory-like setting, but kind of attentive to your own uh, uh, desires and, and attentive to, to where the, the wind is blowing, can be good things. Maybe if schools were more activity-based, maybe if we could individualize curricula better, the impact of ADHD would be lessened. But that, to me, is short of saying... ADHD is just unrelentingly positive. Uh, some of these traits, it's like everything else. Being a little bit depressed can make you sensitive. Right. Responsive to loss. You take time out from your activities and heal. Severe depression uh, can predict suicide and terrible impairment. We're talking about severity and a spectrum here, not yes or no. Okay. Um Interesting note from someone here who says she thinks she survived and completed college despite lots of job problems because her dad believed in her from a very young age. So there you have your support factor. Mm-hmm. Um, um, a question: There are a number of questions related to the persistence of ADHD symptoms or the change of ADHD symptoms in women through the life cycle. So, for example... A couple of people have posted they felt their symptoms, which were manageable until they had children, became unmanageable. Others have asked yep. about feeling that their symptoms had worsened with perimenopause, menopause, or in, in uh, later yep. years. Do you have any comments on how symptoms change over the lifetime, life cycle of women? Well, it's a very um, perceptive and pertinent set of questions here. One of the criticisms of the DSM changed a little bit with DSM-5 is the symptoms are really good for identifying grade school kids, but not adolescents or adults. Right. Obviously, you know, one of the old sort of wordings interrupts or intrudes upon children's games or activities. I mean, that's not a pertinent symptom for an adult. Inattention, not listening to a teacher, 
may be displayed different way. You're not usually listening to your employer or boss every day, but you've got to have the executive function to manage complex and shifting demands in the workplace. What role in life requires the most executive functions of any? Being a parent. (laughs) Being a parent of an infant and toddler and elementary school kid and teenager demands change every day. You've got to take into account development. You've got to be sensitive yet set limits. I think we still don't do a good enough job of really understanding how ADHD manifests in adulthood. We have some evidence out there that finding the right, and it's not right for everybody, but finding the job that allows you to be more active or to be more of your own boss rather Mm -hmm. than sitting in a factory, et cetera, et cetera, may help people's ADHD strengths emerge more. Right. People with ADHD, I think everybody needs support to be a parent more than society gives. If you have ADHD and you're not the most organized and you've got more than one kid or even just one kid, we need to expand our services for ADHD life support to include job management and parenting management, not just doing timeout shares for your six-year-old with ADHD, but how you manage your own life to keep an organized, responsive household. So uh, the short answer is we don't do a good enough job of tracking what ADHD looks like over time. In our own research, we found that a few of our girls, now women, have essentially grown out of ADHD. You could never tell they've had it. Most maintain some symptoms, and not quite half, they're clearly in the ADHD spectrum as adults as they were as kids. Sometimes growing out of the symptoms really helps you, but in other cases, if you didn't get some of the skills and competencies when you're younger, even if you outgrow the symptoms later, you still got some impairments to overcome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, in terms of treatment, um, this here's a question which I think sums up the, uh, the question of a number of people. Medication is often considered almost a miracle for children. What about adults over yeah. the age of 40, 50, 60? Does it make a difference con- considering a lifetime of stigma, failed relationships, um, difficulty in c- completing, you know, holding down a job? Is medication still um, something to consider if you're in your 40s, 50s, or 60s and have been recently diagnosed? The short answer, yes. Let me challenge one of the premises of this uh, apt question. Medication response, we know that about 80% of kids with ADHD will show a positive medication response. It may not be the first pill you try. It may not be the first dose it's tried. It takes some real work to, to individualize and tailor the treatment. Right. But among that 80%, some kids, it's like night and day that, you know, 20 minutes later, the kids, parents and teachers are saying, who is that kid? That's the first time they focused in years. And it's amazing. Most of the time, the improvements are significant and real, but not utterly dramatic. And sometimes, especially for the inattentive presentation of ADHD, you can notice when a kid is not fidgeting or not impulsive. Inattention, you've got to monitor. Maybe they're doing 10 or 20% more homework but you've got to watch carefully to to note that. So, number one, it's not always a miracle day and night cure for kids. Mm -hmm. Number two, if you get a doctor who gets it about prescribing for adults, maybe there's other meds you're taking. Maybe you've got to get a physical to just see how your general metabolism is, et cetera. ADHD meds can be quite successful for adults, but again, most adults with ADHD aren't bouncing off the walls of a classroom the way some kids with ADHD are. You're going to have to tailor your measurement to the symptoms and impairments you want to get improvement in. Sometimes the results are going to be subtle, but they still could be important. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I, I do think we, ha- we, we do hear an attitude from readers, uh, listeners who's, who's, who doctors refuse to treat them because they're over 65 and they say, you know, treatment it with stimulants is not warranted. Um, so well, we, do, we don't have enough research on adults with ADHD. We certainly don't have enough research on older adults with ADHD, but the evidence out there suggests that if it's done well, 
there's a good fighting chance that medications may be about. Yeah. The trick, as you say, is if it's done well, and we know how complex it is to get the right medication, the right dose, the right timing. Um, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, unfortunately. Um, let me just see. Uh, a number of people listening in, a number of the women listening in have, have talked about having been told that they were depressed and having been diagnosed with anxiety and depression when in fact they believe or they were ultimately diagnosed with ADHD. What's your what's your sense or what have you seen with about that that combination of depression, anxiety and ADHD and how to best parse that, take tear that apart? Yeah. Really hard question. So two terms I would use to be a little fancy. One is differential diagnosis. When is it major depression versus ADHD? But the second term is comorbidity. It's quite possible for a person to have both. Both. Mm. One of the cardinal symptoms of major depression is poor concentration. Right. People are preoccupied with their sad mood. People are preoccupied with, is their life worth living? Anxiety and depression go hand in hand. If you're anxious and depressed, it's hard to concentrate. Mm -hmm. This is why a brief 10-minute assessment doesn't do a good job. Of, of, of parsing those two. Right, right. Depressions tend to come in episodes and cycles over time. You need to get a really thorough history of the adult to look at episodes of depression and wellness. ADHD doesn't usually come in waves like that. It's consistently inconsistent most days. Right. But many people with ADHD, not well treated, not well understood, stigmatized, who never really had major depressive disorder before can become demoralized and seem pretty depressed over time if the failures mount. So again, we would do um, a five-hour seminar on this differential diagnosis if we could, but it takes a careful assessment to figure out what's what. Exactly. Um, yeah, and no, a number of people have said that they, that they thought they became depressed because because of not being able to cope well. Um, I'll just end with a very positive statement from Joyce, who said, I'm 66, and I realized in my late 40s that I must have ADHD. Um, I had a very difficult time having a doctor take my symptoms seriously. ADHD was perfect for me while I was a creative director. I was able to hyper-focus. I was able, very creative. Yep. It was yep. very positive. Um, I worked well with people, but when I became a parent, um, I, my, I, my house was a mess and I you know, ultimately was diagnosed and a stimulant made an, an immediate improvement. So Joyce's recommendation is embrace the positive part and get treatment. So it seems like a nice way to end. So Dr. Hinshaw, thank you so much. This sobering research is still, I think, extremely important for us all to be aware of and to be grateful for those advances that have been made for girls and women with ADHD. Yep. And we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.